So, hello there, and welcome back to yet another Night of the Movies podcast. I'm Spike Knight, and in these podcasts, I talk all things movies and TV, and whatever I want, whenever I want. And in today's podcast, and I'm very, very excited about this, in today's podcast, I'm giving my thoughts on The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. But just before I do that, I should say what's the start of every podcast I do, which is if you are watching this podcast on YouTube, hello to my viewers, but if you prefer to listen to your podcast on Spotify, well, even look, as you can also listen to this podcast on Spotify at Night of the Movies on that platform. And if you are already listening to this podcast on Spotify, hello there to podcast listeners, then you can also check out this podcast visually. Yes, you can watch this podcast on my YouTube channel at Night of the Movies on that platform platform as well. Likewise, whatever you may be watching or listening to the podcast, uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the podcast, of course, and please leave me with some feedback on things to improve on in future podcasts because there are always things to improve on and feedback is, as ever, much appreciated. So, let's get into it, shall we? The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. So, I've decided to begin reviewing the Lord of the Rings films on this channel because of how much they mean to me. As every Christmas, me and my family sit down to watch these films. We sit down to watch the Hobbit films and the Lord of the Rings films. If my Lord of the Rings reviews do quite well, I'm going to do some Hobbit reviews too. I'm going to do reviews of the Hobbit movies as well. And I... I really want I've been really wanted to talk about Lord of the Rings films on this channel for a while because of how much they mean to me because they are this annual thing in my household and also because I absolutely love them I love the fellowship of the ring so so much and I'll get on to reviewing two towers and the return of the king you know within the next couple of days to weeks on this channel I haven't quite decided yet But, as of now, in this podcast today, I'm talking about The Fellowship of the Ring. And I love this film so, so much. In fact, I love it that much that I even got my own ring from it. Well, it's not the actual ring from the film, obviously, but I got a prop ring of the one ring on eBay not too long ago. It was only like seven quid. And the annoying thing was... Well, I'm recording this after Christmas now, and for Christmas, my brother, who is also a very big Lord of the Rings fan, I got him a prop one ring, like this one. I don't know how we can see that if you watch on YouTube, but yeah, I got him a prop one ring just like this, but much better. I went on a different website, didn't get it from eBay, and I paid about 10 or more for it. And the annoying thing was that when I went to go and buy one of those for myself, after Christmas, it was no longer available. So, I had to get this one off eBay, and it's like seven quid, and I can't actually put it round my neck because it doesn't fit round my neck, because I have big head, it doesn't fit round my head, so I can hold the ring up, which is really cool, but my brother has a much better one ring prop than I do. But I got this just because we were re-watching the Lord of the Rings films, like the I don't know, 500th time um, over the Christmas period last year, and we're still we, we're still actually watching them right now, we haven't quite finished them all, we've got Return of the King to come up this Sunday, and I was watching them thinking, I need to get the one ring prop, I just need to get a prop from this film to show my love of it, because that's what I do, when I love something so much, I collect things from it, I mean, just look behind me, I've got loads of styles collectibles, and when I love something so, so dearly, I get props from it too, like, I'll You can't see right now, but around this room, I have props. I have helmets from the Star Wars films. And I knew I needed to get a prop from Lord of the Rings films because I I really, really love them. And I actually think that the Lord of the Rings trilogy is simply the best trilogy of all time. I think it's better than the original Star Wars trilogy. And that's saying a lot. Again, look behind me. I love Star Wars. Although, when you're watching the original Star Wars trilogy, there's, there are problems with it. It's not perfect like everyone else makes it out to be. I mean, it's perfect in my eyes, but it does have some problems if I look, if, you know, if I stand back at it and look at it now with my 
film reviewing eyes, I can see that the films have some problems, and you can clearly tell that it was never meant to be a trilogy. Regardless of what George Lucas, who is a genius, says, it was never meant to be a trilogy. Whilst Peter Jackson makes the Lord of the Rings films like they are one trilogy and it's one trilogy to rule them all again i love star wars but lord the lord of the rings trilogy is better than the original star wars trilogy for me and i think the biggest reason for that is i much prefer the first lord of the rings film the fellowship of the ring which i'm talking about this podcast today i much prefer it over a new hope i like a new hope I love The Fellowship of the Ring, though. Straight from the opening, you're thrown into the world of Middle-earth. You are immersed into the world of Middle-earth just like that, through the Howard Shaw musical score, which instantly grabs you and instantly immerses you into what's happening and sets the atmosphere perfect, like... It's, oh, it's so, so good! And then, you get into it. I mean, just the musical score itself. Before anything in the film has actually come up, I am loving it. And then, you have Kate Blanchett as... Gladwell narrating the uh, the prologue to the Lord of the Rings films and then you see the power of the one ring the one ring to rule them all you see how it possesses people and takes them over then you see the power of Sauron the mastermind the evil mastermind behind everything you see the power of him and the evil that he spreads across Middle Earth and in doing all that you get a feel for Middle Earth and where it is at in this point in the timeline at this point when everything with Sauron is going on and the one ring and then you have that big battle where they're all fighting Sauron to get the ring and the battle doesn't last that long but it's so memorable it's so god I'm just thinking about it now and I can remember so many aspects of that one battle sequence and again doesn't really last for that long. The battle sequence, I think, lasts for more, for, for less, sorry, for less than two minutes, but it is so on point, and it's so well directed, and I mean, Peter Jackson just outdoes himself in that opening sequence alone, because you, you see all the trouble that Middle Earth has been through because of this one ring, and then it cuts to the Shire. To Bag End, where you meet Frodo and Bilbo, and just like that, you see the dichotomy, and you see the you instantly understand the difference between the good and the evil in Middle Earth, and he shows you it so beautifully. You see the evil in Sauron and the orcs, and how Sauron has been taking over the lands, and how the evil has been spreading over the lands of Middle Earth, and then you cut to the Shire, and it's heaven. It quite literally is heaven. You know, you look at it and like, yeah, I would want to live there forever and I want to be a hobbit and I never ever want to do anything to get apart from do what hobbits do. Literally like that. I mean, the whole of Hobbiton and the Shire and Bag End is so well crafted and it feels so real it feels tactile like you get up like you, you could touch it whilst you're watching it you can touch the settings whilst you're on screen i mean not only hobbiton but also that whole opening and i love also going back into the opening just a sec i love how the opening has the line of got it here for this time would soon come when hobbits would shape the fortunes of all i love how that line is incorporated into the opening of the film into the prologue and just like that you know <laughs> you know where so well you know how important the hobbits are going to be throughout the journey of these th of these three films even the likes of merry and pippin you know which when you first meet them you don't think they're going to be that important in the first film they become incredibly important when you get to two towers and return to the king and that's something i really love about the prologue because it says the word hobbits it doesn't just say hobbit it says hobbits it's plural it God, I love that line. I love that line so, so much. And I should say, I haven't said this yet, um, I have 
never read the books that these films are based on. So I'm watching this as somebody who does not know the source material whatsoever. I'm not a Tolkien fan. In fact, if I'm being completely frank, I reckon if if I ever read the Lord of the Rings books or the Hobbit book even, although I have read a bit of the Hobbit book, I will say that. So more of the Lord of the Rings books, I reckon they wouldn't work for me. I reckon they wouldn't work for me because of all the different languages. I reckon that would just be alienating to me and it would put me off. But what Peter Jackson does so well with these films is he makes it accessible. From someone like me who hasn't read the books, what I love about this film, I mean all three Lord of the Rings films, but this film in particular, because that's what I'm talking about today, is how real everything feels, is how it all feels accessible. You know, yes, there's all this fan there's all these fancy elements going on in the film, sure. But really when you when you take all the fancy elements away, the Lord of the Rings films are just films about good versus evil. The films about these characters going on a quest to go and destroy the one ring, to come and destroy the one ring and defeat evil in Middle Earth. That's what it is to me. And the characters all feel accessible too. You can completely understand who's who and you get which, you know, you understand the personality of all the characters just like that. There's no one character that's too distant that you can't really associate yourself with them or you can't relate to them. You know, I've actually been called Samwise Gamgee in the past from a couple of people. A couple of people have said I look a bit like Samwise and so I do actually sometimes relate myself to Samwise Gamgee in these films but I also love Gimli. I love how relatable Gimli is and it's all the big uh, battle sequences and the fight sequences and yeah I just love how relatable the film isn't yes it's all very fantastical and all that and it is in a world that is very distant from our own but it's also not because peter jackson he shot a lot of these films yeah he shot all these films actually what i'm saying he shot all these films including the hobbit movies in new zealand and so when you get those long shots the long one takes of these of characters walking on along these location settings, along these long landscapes, along these enormous landscapes. It looks beautiful and it looks like the world we live in because it is the world we live in. And what's so genius about that is it makes everything, it makes Middle Earth feel like we can almost go and visit it ourselves. You know, it makes it feel tactile. I mean, Hobbiton they have actually made into a real place. I think you can actually go and visit that in New Zealand. I mean, I'd love to one day. Um, and I'm not surprised they made it into a real place just because of how real it feels. I love how real these films feel. And I love how they engage you emotionally from the get-go with the music and the characterizations and especially on a rewatch when you see these characters' journeys. Because again, I've rewatched these films countless times. When you when you see their journeys throughout all three films and you see where they begin and you see where they go in two towers and where they end in Return of the King, it's such an emotional roller coaster. And I mean, it's just perfect. These films are simply perfect. And why I think Fellowship of the Ring is perfect is because of all those things. It's because of Relatable and because it's also incredibly well made from Peter Jackson. And I think it is filmmak I think it is his filmmaking at his finest. I think it's him doing his filmmaking at his best. I love his King Kong films pieces. I did a podcast on that before Christmas. I adore that film so so much. This is his. This is one of his best movies, though. I mean, the whole Lord of the Rings trilogy. I don't think as separate films. I normally think of them as one movie. I normally think as a, well, maybe not that. Maybe not as one movie actually, but as one entity. I normally think of them as one thing. Like the Lord of the Rings films are undoubtedly my top ten films of all time now. Ever since I rewatched them um, last year at the cinema, we watched them all together in a showing where it was back to back over midnight, and I ha they had this really <laughs> this really grand effect on me something I, I didn't expect to have have when i watched them at the cinema and ever since then they've made my top 10 favorite movies list and the thing is 
I would say that they're just one entity, though. When I say they're my top ten favourite movies, they're, like, number five. But I don't go, at number five is Fellowship of the Ring, and number four is 2000, number three is Return of the King. No. For me, it's just a number five, the Lord of the Rings films. That's it. The Hobbit movies are a bit of a different thing, because I do think they vary ever so slightly in quality. But the Lord of the Rings films are all perfect. They're all perfect in my eyes. Um, and I'm somebody who watches the extended versions because the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings films are the definitive versions. And people who have never seen the extended versions and who maybe listen to this podcast today, anybody watch the original cuts, watch the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings films. Because they give a far more richer story as... But yeah, they give a far more rich story in Middle Earth. You spend a lot more time with these characters and it let these films breathe. I am someone who's never watched the original cuts of the Lord of the Rings films. I've seen the original cuts of the Hobbit movies and I've seen the extended cuts of the Hobbit films. And I may, as I already mentioned, I may review the Hobbit movies in the forthcoming weeks on this channel. Um, but sticking on to the Lord of the Rings films, sticking with the Lord of the Rings films. I've never seen the original cuts, so I don't know definitively what was in the original cut and what no yeah what was in the original cut no yeah what wasn't in the original cut should I that's what I meant to say there what wasn't in the original cut of Fellowship of the Ring and what's in the extended versions. I don't know for certain. However what I have gathered from looking up online is that if you give me a sec here um there's a lot of payoff. I mean sorry there's a lot of setup is what I meant to say there's a lot of setup for the sequels in the extended versions. There's a lot of stuff about Aragorn being the heir to the throne of Gondor. If I'm getting my facts correct, if I'm getting my details correct, I must admit I'm a little hazy on the details because what I find so fascinating and what I love about the Lord of the Rings films is the filmmaking and how truly amazing it is. So I'm a little bit iffy on the details, so apologies I've got the details wrong there, but it's, you know, there's a lot more about Aragorn being the heir to the throne of Gondon being the true king, hence the name of the third film, We Turn the King. There's a few conversation scenes between, you know, Aragorn and Boromir, which, again, as far as I'm aware, are not in the original cuts. Again, I might be wrong, because I don't know what are the original cuts. I've only ever known the extended versions. When I was watching these films from a very early age, these were the versions of the films that I watched. I've never seen the original cuts. I might one day, but honestly, I think they would just frustrate me. Because be like, that's not in there. Why is that not in there? I know when you get to the later films, Saruman's death isn't in the original cut of Return of the King, which I think is just crazy. Why would you cut out Saruman's death? Um, and there's other stuff later on in the second two films where it's like, really cut all that out? And in this film, you're cutting out all the stuff with Aragorn being the heir to the throne. And I'm like, is that really? Okay, that's quite surprising. And more scenes with Boromir, which I which I feel have always welcomed. You know, and there's a scene with Boromir in the Two Towers, which is not in the original cut. It's a flashback scene where you see between Boromir and Faramir. It's like, how are you cutting these scenes out? And I think, again, if I watch the original cuts, they'll just frustrate me because I've only ever known the extended editions. And even the extended scenes feel purposeful. They don't just feel like they're in there for the sake of, oh, we're going to add more footage into these films because they got such a great reaction the first time around. No, they all serve a purpose to the overall grand story of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, if you haven't seen the extended cuts, I think you can watch them on Prime Video. You might have to rent them or buy them, but I think you can watch them on Prime Video. I'll just go and buy them on DVD, because then you get all the extended, like, well, not the extended, but all the, like, um, special edition stuff about how they made these films. I, I, again, I can't recommend the extended editions enough because they give a far more richer story and a richer experience to these films. I mean, these films are an experience within themselves. Peter Jackson's filmmaking, I mean, he just changed the landscape of fantasy filmmaking forever when he made this film. It is the perfect introduction to Middle Earth because it is action-packed it moves along at a pace it's a quest movie and it's got all these different characters from all these different races and it what it does so well is it throws you in but at the same time though it doesn't throw you in so that you're too deep that you can't understand it if you are new to this world 
it he makes it all accessible and also shows you the power of his filmmaking and what he is what his vision is for middle earth and in his vision for middle earth is truly remarkable it is astounding i watch these films now and they still hold up they still hold up over 20 years since they first released i mean i'm jealous of the people who got to watch in the cinema the, for the first time in 2001 i am so jealous of that because i would have loved to watch these films in the cinema growing up and you know one growing up watching these films in the cinema seeing them released for the first time going and getting excited because he always used to release every christmas getting excited for christmas not because of christmas but because of the lord of the rings trilogy i would have loved to have that experience and i have seen all these three films in the cinema now which is something I'm very happy to say because it's a very different experience watching them in the cinema than watching them at home. I love watching them at home. I really love watching them at home because you can pause it, whatever, and go to the loo when you want to, and particularly in the extended editions where, you know, the extended edition for Fellowship of the Ring is like three hours and 48 minutes. The extended edition for four, for Two Towers is like four hours long. And the extended edition for Return of the King is around four hours and 20 minutes. You know, they get, increasingly longer the extended editions and you know it is hard to hold in sometimes your bladder when you're watching these films so yeah i i do enjoy watching them at home because you can pause them and go on saloon and you don't have to miss anything and the extended editions i they're made to be watched at home but when i went to go and watch in the cinema last year in november was it october last year it was sometime maybe in september actually yeah when i went to go and watch these films in the cinema last year it was extended editions and i it, there was just something about watching these films in the cinema and really experiencing them with other people around you because it was at one of these special screenings where I was in a room full of Lord of the Rings fans, full of people who wanted to be there. At least it seemed like they wanted to be there because especially in Fellowship of the Ring, you know, there was people quoting the film, <laughs> quoting it from the get-go and clapping and getting excited every single time something happened in the film every single time the ring i remember those two people two people in front of me and every single time the ring there was again every single time the ring appeared on screen they would take a drink <laughs> which you know if you watch that first lot of the rings film it's quite a lot so i wonder how drunk they were by the end of fellowship but still i watched them back to back and it, it was very different it was something i'd never really had in a cinematic experience. That might be my favourite cinematic experience of last year. Not any of the new films that came out, but re-watching Lord of the Rings films and re-watching them in the cinema. I'd seen Two Towers in the cinema before, but that was it. I hadn't seen any of the others. And even watching Two Towers in the cinema again was a very different experience because it was a very different cinema. And there was just something about it that when I saw it in a cinema, I was like, oh, I really get this now. I really understand as well. I really understand the love for it because again, I had seen a lot of Rings songs for the however many times growing up, but they never really had. I mean, they did have a great effect to me, but not nearly as much as they did last year when I got to a point where I hadn't seen these films in like three years and I was watching them in the cinema and I was going, I mean, they didn't even feel like films. They just feel like experiences. It feels like, you know, you get your ticket and it was a Lord of the Rings experience. That's what they feel like. And Fellowship of the Ring really feels like that. You feel like you're on these quests. You feel like you're on this quest with these characters. You feel like you were there in Rivendell or there in Hobbiton or there in the Mines of Moria or was it Fangor and Forest at the end if I remember names correctly. I'm not great at names for these songs I've already mentioned but you feel like you're there in all the locations with these characters because of the filmmaking, because of the world which feels so weird and going back on to the filmmaking I just skimmed past it now no I really want to touch on the filmmaking quite a lot the sizes I still today don't understand how they do the sizes in these films and what you mean by that is the height of the characters that's what I meant to, that's what I meant to say that the height of the characters just in case people didn't quite realise what I meant the hobbits and the dwarfs and the human characters are all different sizes <laughs> I don't, I still today don't quite understand how they made that work. I mean, if I watched the behind the scenes special features on the Lord of the Rings films, I dare say there'd be something explaining it. But it'd be way out of my 
knowledge. Like, I won't have a clue what they're talking about. It's And there's so many sequences where they're all different sizes too. And I know sometimes they did have actors who are much smaller come into play the hobbits he did have some actors who have dwarfism come into actually standing for the hobbits in certain shots where you see um kites walking over long landscapes there's a couple moments like that where you can tell but for example when frodo first interacts with gandalf at the start towards the beginning of fellowship of the ring and when they're both on the um Oh, what's it called? The horse carriage together. Yeah, when they're both on the horse carriage. I don't, I don't think it's called a horse carriage. But when they're both on the horse carriage together. And it's like, how are they doing the sizes? I, I, I still don't get that now. And again, this film came out in 2001. It's over 20 years old. And just the sizes alone, just the height of the characters and how they make it seem like the different heights when in real life you actually look at the actors you look at images of the actors at the premieres for these films they're all the same heights they're not different heights and yet it's seamless in this film you, you wouldn't believe that they're not different heights if you didn't know and that sounds like quite a small thing making all the actors different heights but from somebody who well i don't i've never believed in filmmaking too much in my life in the past but from, we, from someone who watched a lot of the behind the scenes features on many other films you see how hard it is to make a movie and to see how difficult it must have been to do that like I actually remember watching behind the scenes features on the first Hobbit movie and I was like astounded by how they did the Hobbits well how did the Bilbo uh, the dwarfs and Gandalf at different heights I mean Again, I'm finding this mind blowing and watching them go, how have we done the different heights there? How do you make it so seamless? How do you make it so it doesn't stand out and look gimmicky? So you're not looking at John Reese Davies as Gimli and going, well, he's clearly just on his knees when he's next to Legolas, when he's next to Orlando Bloom as Legolas. How do you make it so it doesn't look like um, Frodo, well, it doesn't. How do you make it so it doesn't like Frodo and Gandalf and in the same room together? How do you make it so it looks like they are in the same room together when I don't know if they even were? That's how well it's done. I, I really don't understand how they did the height. It still surprises me now <laughs> because when I watched these films the first time, I generally all thought that the actors wore different heights. I was wrong. Again, it, <laughs> it's so seamless and. The musical score. I mean, Howard Shaw just composed the perfect fancy musical score, encapsulating, perfectly encapsulating at that, the feel of this world and the feel of the Shire, the temptation of the one wing, you know, and the... And then the feel of the Shire again, you know, the... I, I, I listen to um I would uh, most days I listen to the track concerning Hobbits from the Lord of the Rings score and it just takes me back to Hobbits and just like that just like that it takes me back and that is a power of an incredible musical score and it's not only those two themes you also get the theme for the Orca you know bah, 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 bah. Bom bom bom, and then the music that's used the mines of Moria, the music that's used in Riverdale, you know. Da, 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 da. Bah, 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 bah. I mean, I'm singing it terribly, but I can I can just hear the music in my head though, you know. And the music where you see the fellowship all come together, you know. Bom bom ba ba bom da 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 Bum 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 bum. That piece of music. That piece of music is only really used when the fellowship is together because it's not actually used properly again after this film until we turn the king. Like you don't actually hear that music to its full until we turn the king again. You get a bit of it in Two Towers. You get bits of it in Return of the King. Like you get a little bit of it when in the Battle of Helm's Deep, Legolas is basically skateboarding down that um <laughs> he's got the orakai shield and he's skateboarding down the staircase and he's firing at all the orakai and then you get a little bit of it in return of the king when 
um, Samwise is facing up against Shelob. You get bits of it here and there, and the other examples that I haven't used in 2000 Return of the King, but you don't properly get it after the film until towards the end of Return of the King, until the last hour of that film, because Howard Shaw, what he did so well is he only really uses the yeah he uses the fellowship theme you know bum bum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba ba bum bum ba dum he only really uses that theme when the fellowship are all together and then when the fellowship are breaking up he doesn't use it he doesn't have that theme to its fullest until we turn to the king again and I love how he did that I love how he has hints of those themes when you see the fellowship. Um, at their best in the second two films, but he doesn't, again, he doesn't use it to its fullest. I love that about the musical score. <laughs> and there's so many other aspects to the musical score which I think is absolute, I think are absolutely incredible. I think this is a perfect musical score, and I think it marries up perfectly to Peter Jackson's visuals, and I really think it makes the world of Middle Earth in Fellowship of the Ring, so believable and so authentic and so tactile, like you can almost touch it. It makes this world so much more. It makes it so the audience can emotionally invest into the world of Middle Earth. You know, I love how it shows musical scores for these films. Love them, and I love his score for Fellowship. <sighs> I listen to it daily. It's called Fellowship. I, um, the complete recordings on Spotify from Fellowship of the Ring, I listen to them every day, and I think that I think it's just uh, yeah, perfect. As I've already said, the musical score is perfect. The casting is all perfect. You know, you completely believe all these actors in the roles they're playing, whether it's Elijah Wood, Sean, Elijah Wood as Frodo Baggins, Sean Astin as Samwise Gamgee, Billy Boyd as Mary, Dominic Monaghan as Pippin, or did I get those two the wrong way around? Yeah, Dominic Monaghan plays Mary, Billy Boyd plays Pippin, so Eden McKellen as Gandalf. He has so many great moments in this film. <sighs> you can't see anyone else playing Ian McKellen. You you can't, see anyone, you can't see anyone else playing Ian McKellen, what I'm going on about. You can't see anyone else playing Gandalf now, can you, after watching these films? And to think Sean Connery almost played him. Sean Connery almost played Gandalf, which, you know, I like Sean Connery, but I can't see him ever doing it. Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn. Orlando Bloom as Legolas, and I think it's actually Orlando Bloom's best performance. John Rhys Davies as Gimli. Oh, again, perfect casting. Sean Bean as Boromir. Um, Hugo Weaving as Elrond, Liv Tyler as Arwen, Sir Ian Holm as Bilbo Baggins, as old Bilbo Baggins, and Sir Christopher Lee as Sourman. Sourman is such a good villain. I love every single time he's on screen, Christopher Lee as Sauron, it feels threatening. Oh, God. At some point, and Christopher Lee wants to be in these films, you know, because he had met Tolkien, and he, I read somewhere that he read the Lord of the Rings book, uh, yeah, he read the Lord of the Rings books, should I say, every Christmas. It was an annual thing for him, so he wanted to be in these films when he heard they were being made. He is... I mean... <laughs> it's Christopher Lee. Need I say more? Perfect as Saruman. And I love this scene when Gandalf realises that Saruman has turned evil and he is following the order of South One. I love that scene where all the doors are shutting in the Tower of Isengard. What's it called now? It might even be called that. The the, the Tower of Isengard. You know what I'm on about. Hopefully you do. If you've seen the films. I love when all the doors are shutting there and then Gandalf realises and Saruman uses his power and puts Gandalf on the floor. And the musical score and it's like this choir orchestral and it's, it's heightening up and it's oh, brilliant. I'm probably explaining it awfully. But, oh my god, that moment in the film when Gandalf realises that Saruman has turned evil gets me every time. And I don't mean that emotionally, I mean that it gets me excited. It still blows me away now. And for me, the most emotional part of the film is actually when you see Frodo reunite with Bilbo at Rivendell. That's the most emotional part of the film for me. Um... Am I going to say why? No, I'm not going to say why today, but, you know, it's the most emotional part for me with the music swell, you know. But, 
Bum, bum, ba -da -dum, with the music swells and when they reunite with one another. And Rivendell, I mean, that's just heaven as well. That quality is heaven in these films. You know, <laughs> Mount Doom and Isengard and what's the other one called? Oh, I'm forgetting it right now off the top of my head, but all the, where, where the orcs are and where the Urukai are, that is hell. That is the personification of hell in these films and the, personific and the personification of heaven is Rivendell and that's so beautifully um, conveyed in these films. That's so beautiful, beautifully conveyed. And a lot of people complained about the end of this film when it first came out from what I remember, well from what I've heard, not from what I remember. I wasn't around when these films came out. I wasn't even born when the first Lord of the Rings film came out. Um, but a lot of people complained about the ending from what I gathered when this film came out. And I loved the ending though. I love the ending because it's the end of part one. That's how the end of a trilogy should be. That's how the end. That's how the end of part one in a trilogy should be, in my opinion. It shouldn't be too rounded off that you can't really, you know, continue the story, and it shouldn't be too closed off that it shouldn't have some threads going on, but too closed off that the story, if it was continued, didn't really work. It should have an open ending if the trilogy is being made as a trilogy like the dune films are nowadays i don't mind if an open ending's done also the ending to the film isn't that open-ended yeah the fellowship split up and you see frodo and sam still going on their quest and you see all the other characters going on their side quests which are explored in two towers return of the king but it's still a closed off ending in my opinion you still see that all these characters I found one another to rely on to a certain degree. I mean, I mean obviously Merry and Pippin get taken by the other Kai, but you still know that they are together. You still learn that yes, the Fellowship have separated and they've lost and they've lost Gandalf the Grey, but they are all still together in their own separate ways. If you follow my thinking, and I love that end. For me, perfectly ends the story of the Fellowship of the Ring. Because it'd be weird if the second Lord of the Rings film was called Fellowship of the Ring Part 2. I mean, I know it wouldn't be called that because obviously it's based on the books, but it'd be weird if it was called that because the whole film, I think, is about the Fellowship coming together and then the Fellowship breaking up. And so the perfect ending is when you do see them separate and Frodo and Sam go on their own journey to destroy the Worn Ring. And my favourite line in this film, and there's so many classic lines, there are so, so many classic lines. However, my favourite line in this film is when you see Frodo going off by himself to destroy the ring and Sam is running, he's, he's on the boat and he's starting to row away and they see Sam running to catch up with him and he goes, Mr. Frodo, Mr. Frodo, wait! He says something like that and then Frodo goes, um, leave Sam and go to destroy the one the one ring alone and then Sam says of course you are but I'm coming with you it's something like that and just that one line of course you are but I'm coming with you and it's oh that's why I love these films the character relationships the character development the, the character development and the writing it's so on point it's so well done and it, it just makes you smile when you think of it and it also makes you feel quite emotional because obviously that photo and Sam relationship and how you see it progress throughout Two Towers and then how you see it conclude in Return of the King and how it's beautifully set up in the Fellowship. Like I love when they have the Council of Elrond um, and the Warriors and what's through the ring and then this Frodo says, I will go to destroy the ring myself. And then you get, you know, Legolas come in and Gimli and Gandalf the Grey and Aragorn and Bormir. They all say they're going to go and help. And then you find out that Merry Pippin and Sam have all been listening on the Council of Elrond, which they really shouldn't have been doing. But you find out that they've all been listening in and they're going to help as well because they all want to help Frodo destroy this ring. And it's that whole idea of companionship. The way that is conveyed in the, in the Fellowship of the Ring is... One of the elements I, one of the reasons I love this first film so much. I mean, I just love it. I really, really, really love it. And I could go on and on about how much I love this film, but I've done that already. I don't know how long this podcast has lasted for so far, but I've done that already. And for me, it is really just perfect. It's a perfect introduction to Middle Earth. 
I don't understand people who can watch this film and not be swept up by it and fall in love with these characters and get emotionally connected to the story and just believe in this world of Middle Earth and not be enthralled by it all and the action sequences which are so massively done and you feel the care and passion and thought that has been put in to every single scene in the film. None of the scenes in the film, not, not even like seconds of a scene, feel that like they haven't had care and passion put into it. You feel the passion in the Fellowship of the Ring and in the late Lord of the Rings films too. But for now, you feel the relation, you feel the passion in put into Fellowship of the Ring, and that comes across on the screen. And you just can't help but fall in love with it. I don't understand people who don't like these films. One of my closest mates said he watched um, the first half an hour of Fellowship of the Ring not too long ago and said they were bored by it. I'm like, it's like, what film did you watch? Because it wasn't Fellowship of the Ring. I can understand people being bored by the first Hobbit movie. Personally, I love it, but I can understand people being bored by that. Still, I don't understand... You know, you must be on a different world if you are bored by Fellowship of the Ring. I mean, it's all subjective. But still, I like... <laughs> I'm watching this now, and the CGI still holds up. The special effects are incredible. The musical score, pitch perfect. No perfect, in fact. The directing from Peter Jackson is some of his finest. You know, I said this when I spoke about P when I spoke about Peter Jackson's King Kong. I said Peter Jackson just doesn't just make doesn't just make a film. He makes a movie. And with Fellowship of the Ring, Peter Jackson doesn't just make a fancy film like Willow. No, he and by the way, I actually quite like Willow, but he doesn't just make a fancy film like Willow. He makes a fantasy film, and he doing so changes the landscape of fantasy filmmaking forever. You know, it scares other people away from doing it. Quite literally. Any other any fantasy film which comes out nowadays, people compare to Lord of the Rings. That's what happens. You know, it is really the godfather of fantasy films. It's like whenever there's a crime film that comes out nowadays, people compare it to the godfather. Whenever there's a fantasy film that comes out nowadays, and I do this as well, people compare people compare it to the Lord of the Rings films. Because they're just so brilliant. They're perfect. And Fellowship of the Ring is a perfect introduction to this world and the extended edition i don't care what anyone else says the extended edition is the definitive version and the prosthetic i haven't even spoken about the prosthetics and the costume designs and the way they made the orakai look they're menacing that scene where you see the orakai first being manifested first being brought into being the orakai still gives me chills now the whole film gives me goosebumps and chills even though again i've never read the books every scene in this film gives me goosebumps gives me chills and Gandalf facing against the Balrog, all the scenes in the Mines of Moria, and then when you see Bormir's death, spoilers there for people who haven't seen the film, but if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, what are you doing? But the death of Bormir at the start, at the end, not at the start of the film, at the end of the film, the opening of the film itself, the prologue, all the stuff in Hobbiton, all the stuff with the ring waves, if I remember that's what they're called, or they just what are they called? The Nazgul side. The ring, wings, ring waves were in the later films, if I have my facts correct. Uh, I just rewatched Two Towers recently, that's why I'm thinking about them. But yeah, the Nazgul, all the stuff with them, and the introduction to Merry and Pippin. Oh, God, Gandalf's fireworks. I mean, Rivendell and the Council of Elrond. All this stuff just gives me goosebumps. And Saruman. How can you forget about Saruman, one of the greatest villains in cinematic history? And I think a lot of that is down to Christopher Lee. I mean... Oh god, this is perfect. And there's so many stuff I've already spoken about. The characters and the character development in this film alone. And it beautifully sets up the character development for the next one. And yes, these films are long. And I can completely understand someone saying they would feel long for me. They don't feel as long as they are. Like I said, the extended edition that I always watch for Fellowship of the Ring is like 3 hours and 48 minutes. It feels about 2 hours and a half. It feels long, yes, to a degree. But not nearly as long as it is. And... Yes, you feel long, but they move at such a pace, and there's not a single moment of these films that I would take out of them. And there's not a single moment of Fellowship of the Ring that I would take out of it. I absolutely love Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, if you hadn't grasped that already. And I think it's a perfect introduction to Middle Earth. I think it's a perfect introduction to Middle Earth. And I think <sighs> Peter Jackson just, yeah. He made a masterpiece for the ages. He made a solid classic that people like myself still watch over 20 years later because 
Fellowship of the Ring is simply perfect. It's a masterpiece of the fancy genre. I mean, it's a master. It's a masterpiece of cinema. It really is. And so, all in all, I'm going to say that Lord of the Rings. I'm going to say the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. I'm going to say it's a 10 out of 10. There isn't a single thing I would change about this film. And it hasn't dated. I know a lot of people really love the original Star Wars trilogy, but you can watch that now and go, okay, the parts of that which is a bit dated, again, love the original Star Wars trilogy. Look behind me if you don't believe me. Uh, but the parts of the original Star Wars trilogy which are dated, you can tell that in the visual effects to a degree. It was, you know, mind-blowing and um, pushing the boundaries at the time they were made, but they were dated, a little dated now. I don't think the Lord of the Rings films, I don't think Fellowship of the Ring looks dated at all. It's still held up incredibly well. Yeah, I wouldn't say any of it really feels dated. Not even the CGI. I mean, they're pushing the boundaries of this film. And again, you can see the care and passion that has gone into making this. And the fact that Peter Jackson was a person who directed it. I mean, look at this film before he died to this. I haven't seen Heavenly Creature, so I can't comment on that. But he made The Frighteners before I made this. And The Frighteners is an enjoyable film. But it's nothing like Fellowship of the Ring. It's got a couple of similarities. There's a couple of moments where you can tell, oh yeah, that's clearly a Peter Jackson film when you watch The Frighteners and when you watch Fellowship of the Ring. There are a couple of moments where you can tell from the same director, but there were almost no other similarities. And it's like, wow, you know, I can't believe someone was able to achieve this vision and make it work. And I still, I don't think it'll ever be, I don't think it'll ever be done again. The Dune films are very good, and I'm very excited for Dune 2. You know, the first Dune film was very good, and I'm very excited for Dune 2. But I don't think it's, they're going to achieve quite the same effects that the Lord of the Rings films have on me, personally. Yeah, I love these films, and I love Flesh of the Ring because it's incredibly well made. It feels beautifully adapted, even though I don't know the source material. It feels well adapted. Um... The acting and the casting is perfect. The location and set design is perfect. The action sequences are massively done. The dichotomy of good and evil in the film is so well orchestrated and so well conveyed. The pacing is perfect. The creature character and set designs are all mesmerizing. The music score is not perfect. Jackson directing is his finest and it is the best First film in a trilogy ever. It's the best introduction to a trilogy, in my opinion. Yeah. I love it. Love, love, love. Fellowship of the Ring. And so for that reason, I am once again going to say that Fellowship of the Ring is the perfect introduction to Middle Earth. And I'm also, once again, going to give it a 10 out of 10 from me. Anyway, guys, that's it for today's podcast. So, if you have seen The Fellowship of the Ring, please let me know your thoughts on it in the comment section below. Also, let me know your thoughts on which is your favourite Lord of the Rings film, because I'll hopefully get around to reviewing them within the next couple of days to weeks on this channel. Again, I haven't quite decided yet. But anyway, let me know your thoughts on Fellowship of the Ring in the comment section below. And if you haven't seen Fellowship of the Ring, what the hell are you waiting for? Go and watch it. It's pretty sure it's on Netflix, or it's on one of the streaming services for free. And again... Just go and watch it because you'll experience a whole different kind of cinema if you haven't seen this film yet. And as always, thank you for watching or listening to this podcast. And if you haven't yet, please do click down below and like and subscribe on this podcast. I look forward to many more podcasts coming very, very soon on this channel. As we said, thank you so much for watching or listening to, or listening to this podcast and I will see you guys again soon. But bye for now. Bye.